So now that we've talked a bit about the course, let's start talking about Java. Now, some of this is, is guaranteed to be review, so I've tried to orient it in a way where we spend as little time as possible on things you most likely know and focus on things you're less likely to know, just to avoid wasting everybody's time. So we're going to start off by discussing the, the two primary programming paradigms that are supported by modern Java. And, and modern Java here means Java 8 and beyond. And we'll, as we'll see, Java 8 came out in the 2014 time frame. I think we're now up to Java 12, um, which is cool, except for the fact that Android only supports Java 8 for a whole bunch of different reasons that will take too far, too long to get into. Now, the object-oriented parts of Java, which is almost certainly what you know, I certainly hope you know this stuff, include three primary capabilities. And these capabilities are abstraction, inheritance, and polymorphism. And I will briefly, briefly, briefly talk about them. I suspect you probably know what this means, even if you're not always familiar with all the funny words. The second paradigm, which is where we're going to spend the, the vast amount of time in this portion of the course, is on the so-called functional programming features. And these are, are really quite cool, uh, and you may not be as familiar with them. Throughout this discussion, I will show you lots of examples of Java, especially the functional programming stuff. So it won't just be you know, dry, boring lecture where we're talking about concepts. We're going to be like, let's take a look at how to do this with Java 8 features. And it, it'll really be cool, I think. So Java 8 is a really fascinating programming language. Java 8 and beyond is a fascinating programming language that combines the object-oriented and functional paradigms. So if you were to sort of look at the broad landscape of programming language features, you would see that there's sort of the classic procedural programming language features in languages like C and Fortran, mostly you know, functions and uh, subroutines. Right? This is kind of the old school way of doing things. So that's from like the, the 50s to the 70s. And then in the 70s and 80s and the 90s, we moved to an object-oriented way of doing things. So you have languages like C++ and Java and C Sharp and arguably Python. But then on the other hand, you see that there's these other language families. And if you take the CS270 course, they'll go into this in a lot more detail than I'm going to go to in here. But there's functional programming languages like ML and Haskell and these other things called logic programming languages. And Java 8 is kind of this hybrid, you know, sort of like like the Sphinx or, or a Griffin, that's a combination of things. So object-oriented programming as a paradigm is a so-called imperative paradigm. What does it mean to be imperative? What it means is that a program written in an object-oriented style consists of commands that tell the computer what to do. So you're telling the computer to you know, take this thing and store it there, or read from this thing and put it someplace else, or perform some kind of operations. And imperative programming focuses on describing in code how to manipulate the state of the program via various statements. So the whole thing is about mutable state, like Play-Doh. You can reshape it in various forms. So let's take a look at a really simple example to illustrate this. And this, this should be very familiar to you, hopefully, if you've taken 101 or the equivalent. So this is a a method called zap. We give it a list of strings called lines. We give it a string parameter that we want to be the string to omit. And what we're going to do here is we're going to remove a, this string from the list of strings, and we're going to return the updated list. So the first thing we do is we create a new local variable called res for result, which will be a new array list. And then we go ahead and we iterate through each of the strings in the lines parameter. So for each line in lines using Java's for each loop, we're going to check to see whether or not the line that we want to omit equals the line in the, the current line in the list of lines. And then we go ahead, and if, if it does equal that, we're going to skip it, right? We're going to ignore it, because we're zapping the omitted string. But if it doesn't match, we're going to go ahead and add it to the results list by using add. And when we're all done, we're going to return the list of non-matching lines. So we've zapped them. So I hope that looks pretty straightforward. If, if, if you're sitting here going, what on earth is happening? You're probably in the wrong class, right? So hopefully you can understand that. 
Um, let's do a little bit of analysis of this. So one of the things about this, it's pretty straightforward, but it does something that's known as the accumulator anti-pattern. And what, this is a very, very, very common anti-pattern, by the way. It's like probably every, every piece of code you wrote in CS101 and CS201 and so on is, looks exactly like this. But the problem here is that we are hard coding this implementation to always run sequentially. And that's because we're accumulating things into a single variable. And you might think, well, why is that a problem? How could I do it any differently? Well, I'll show you in a second how to do it differently. And the way we're going to do it differently is by introducing the functional model, which is a so-called declarative paradigm. And that's just a fancy way of saying that rather than describing how to change state via explicit algorithmic steps, we're instead going to say what we want to have done rather than how to do it. So declarative is about the what rather than the how. So imperative is kind of about the how. Take this thing, assign it here, do a check conditionally, and so on. In contrast, declarative programming says, what are we trying to do? And I describe my desires from computation point of view from what I want done, not how to do it. And the way I always think about this, I, you'll see very quickly, I love, I love visual metaphors. So almost all my slides have something that's visual. So I think about like a big iceberg where there's a little part on the surface that you see and then there's a big part that's underneath. And so in this model, the what is the small piece, and the how is the bigger piece. And by focusing on the what, not the how, your code is going to get a lot shorter, arguably easier to understand once you understand how to read the syntax, and definitely easier to optimize. And that's the key point to this. So rather than just talking abstractly about this, let's take a look at our zap method and now we're going to rewrite this to declaratively remove a given string from the list of lines. So this is the, the functional way of doing things. So the first thing we do is we take the list of lines that was passed as a parameter, and we convert that list into something called a stream. And as you'll discover in a couple weeks, a stream is a, is a Java 8 framework that allows you to compose functions together in a very flexible and systematic way. So we turn each string in this list into a stream of strings. And then we go ahead and we are going to filter out anything in that stream that matches the omit parameter. So anything that equals omit is going to be ignored. And the way we do that is we filter out anything that's, um, or we filter in, because you always filter in. You always accept through the filter anything that matches this expression. And we're going to say anything that is not equals, we let through. Anything that is equals, we ignore. And notice how this doesn't say how to do it. It just says what you want done. It says let things through that don't equal the, uh, the omit string. And then the final thing we do is we collect that stream into a list, and we return that back as the return result from zap. So if you look at this, a couple things to note. Number one, we don't say anything about how to do it. We just say what we want to have done. Now, if you're familiar with functional programming, it's like, oh, yeah, that's obvious. If you're not familiar with functional programming and you've mostly worked with sort of that sequential accumulator anti-pattern we talked about, you're probably like, what the heck is that? And how do I understand this? Don't worry, we'll cover all that shortly. What you should observe also is this concept known as fluent programming, where you chain together a sequence of method calls that the next call in the chain works on the output of the previous call. So we take the output of stream. That goes as the input to filter. Filter does its magic. It outputs the filtered stream. And then we collect it into a list. So that's called fluent programming. And you'll see that over and over and over again. You'll also see that, by the way, in non-functional styles. It's very popular in general. The other thing to note is we can trivially convert this from sequential, which is what we had here. So this was the sequential way of doing things, in parallel by just changing stream to parallel stream. And that's the real beauty of the functional approach. By focusing on the what, not the how, 
we can make these radical changes in performance. So we're now doing the filtering in parallel with only minuscule changes in the code. And the reason why we could do that is because two things. Number one, it was declarative. We said what, not how. So going from stream to parallel stream lets the implementation figure out the how, not us. And number two, this, these sets of operations are so-called stateless. They don't actually um, maintain state. They just work on the input and the output flowing through the stream. Is there a question? Great question. So the question here is, um, the way I've written this, it's, it's like sort of a cascading fluid interface where we take the output of one thing and we implicitly route it as the input to the next thing in this fluent chain. Um, and, and if we were to write this more incrementally or more um, step by step, if we, if we stored something uh, into a stream and then we took that stream and we made an object and we filtered it and then we took that thing and we collected it, that could still be paralyzable. That, that wouldn't affect that. Um, probably uglier to read, maybe, to, to someone who knew streams. Uh, to someone who's not as familiar with streams, this may actually look like it's complicated because it's like, oh my god, you know, it's all these transformations. So you could certainly break it up into pieces, but you could still paralyze it. And you'll see lots of examples of that when we get a little further along. Great question. Other questions about this example? Yeah. Oh, great question, great question. So the question here is, um, how large does the list need to be before you actually get a benefit from parallelizing? And the answer is, uh, there's actually a, a formula to compute this, which is the n times q formula. And n is the number of elements in the list. So n would be like if the list was a million versus 10, right? That's n. And q is the quantity of time required to process each element. So, so if you're not, in this particular case, we're sort of doing a comparison, so it's a very fast check. In other cases, as you'll see, we could be doing downloading an image, or filtering an image, or writing an image to a disk, a much larger queue, right? Much larger quantity of time. So if n times q gets big, that's going to be a win from a parallelization point of view. If n times q is small, honestly, you're, you're better off doing it sequentially. And there's various heuristics that say if n times q is larger than 10,000, then it's probably worth doing a parallel stream. Whether that's always true on every piece of hardware and everything is, is up for grabs. The way to think about it, though, is because it's so ridiculously trivial to go from stream to parallel stream, write your code like this benchmark it on some representative input, then do this, benchmark it again, and if you get a speed up, you're like, that's great. If it slows down, which it actually does slow down sometimes, sometimes parallel streams will make things run slower, and I'll show you lots of examples of that later, then you're like, okay, not such a good idea. But the cool, the cool thing is, if you discover that parallel streams aren't working, what's the solution? You do that, right? Whereas if you'd written your code using that sequential accumulator anti-pattern, and you parallelize that code, oh my gosh, your life would be a living hell switching back and forth between the sequential version and the parallel version. Because you would have to manage threading, and you have to do all this gobbledygook. Really complicated. And yet, this is just absolutely trivial to switch between the things. So that's kind of the teaser here to motivate you as to why you would, you would learn all this stuff and why you'd learn to write functional code, because it's so much easier to optimize it without having to do the work yourself. So you can transparently optimize it. OK, so that is the end of that.